everybody. Um, I'm Richard Idell. I'm program chair for the forum this year. Welcome to uh, the 8 o'clock session on ethics. You all get an award for being here. It's an early hour. Um, we have an uh, interesting panel this morning that's uh, focusing on ethical issues that come up in entertainment and sports practices um, where the lawyer is interfacing with investment advisors or investments or being asked, act, asked to act in an investment advisory capacity um, and, and uh, issues concerning you know, what are the rules governing lawyers, what are the rules governing investment advisors, how do they all mix and match, and uh, uh, what are the practice tips that uh, we can give you in your practice to avoid uh, problems. Um, our panel this morning, um, it's a group of three experts uh, in various areas that bear on this. Uh, Jerry Fishkin, Jerome Fishkin, who's to my right, is a, uh, an attorney specializing in attorney professional responsibility and conduct matters. He uh, is an expert witness. I've used him as an expert on occasion. Uh, advises attorneys on ethics and law practice management and he represents attorneys in uh, state bar disciplinary matters and, and uh, law students in bar application matters. Um, to his right is uh, Tracy Nickel. She is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to Mike's, Mike's right. Say to him. Is uh, Tracy Nickel and um, she, you're, you're not a lawyer, right? No, I'm not uh, a lawyer. Not, it's not a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. She's, she's, she works with a lot of lawyers. Manage, <coughs> yes. She's managing director of uh, BNY, Bank of New York, Mellon Wealth Management. She's the managing director for BNY Mellon's Wealth Management Group in Southern California. And as managing director, she oversees the wealth management development strategies and team in uh, West LA, Los Angeles, and Newport Beach. Um, <coughs> seated. Uh, to Jerry's right is Michael Deutsch. He's a principal with Eclipse Sports Management and a lawyer uh, with the law firm of Singer and Deutsch in New York. He's been, Mike has an interesting mix of practice, which you'll hear about. He's been a professional ice, he's been an uh, agent for professional ice hockey players since 1994. And, uh, in 1995 founded his firm Eclipse Sports Management and has negotiated contracts for professional ice hockey players from around the world including uh, those in the NHL and European elite leagues and in addition to that he has a law practice which um, quite germane to our panel in fact when I, uh, I I didn't know that he had uh, his sports agency practice when we first talked about this panel but uh, in his law practice, uh, he specialized in representing uh, individuals affiliated primarily in the securities and commodities industry. So he represents uh, uh, people who have legal issues concerning investment advisory practices, securities issues, and that sort of thing. So very on point practice. So let's get started. Um, you know, we've all had the situation in our practices. Um, if you do any amount of sports or entertainment where at some point a client comes to you and they ask you a non-legal question, you know, can you, here, here's a deal someone wants me to do, what do you think about it? What's your, you know, if you, if you, if this were you, would you do it? And suddenly you've got a, an offering circular or some type of transaction that this client is asking you to uh, give advice on. Um, you didn't take that course in law school. Um, business advice, and uh, you're a lawyer, you're not a business person um, who generally gives advice on that. What do you do? What are the rules that uh, apply when you're doing that type of work? Um, what would your malpractice carrier think about you're doing that kind of work? Um, so what we want to focus on this morning in the short time that we have is, you know, what are the issues, what are the rules, and how do you deal with it? And I'd like to turn first to Jerry Fishkin to... Uh, Talk about what are the what are the rules that uh, come up in a law practice when the client wants the lawyer to act as an investment advisor or monitor or work with a business advisor or business manager. Uh, 
you got to expect if you step out of, if we step out of our roles as legal advisors and go into other areas, advise clients about finances or even get involved in you know investing with them, a couple things are going to happen. First of all, we're going to be governed by attorney fiduciary rules. Is the first thing to keep in mind. In most states, the fact that you're an attorney means if you're doing the attorney work plus the financial advising work, they're going to look at the financial advice through the lens of what your lawyer duties are. And I don't know if that's you know tighter or looser depending upon what other field of advice you're giving your client, but generally it's a very high high, high standard. Second is uh, Richard made a point that I'm glad he raised. Before you start wandering off into outside of your, your comfort zone and into fields you've never been into, reread your malpractice policy and see how much of what you're about to do is excluded. Uh, there are, I'm aware of it now because we just got our malpractice renewal and it seems every year there's this new stack of things that we have to sign and promise we don't do uh, and, and, and don't get insured. The, the next thing is the basic standard, whether you're looking at a discipline or a civil standard, is if you get involved and go the next step, and, you know, your client brings an investment opportunity and says, gee, why don't we each put a couple hundred grand in this? For the most part, you are now doing business with your client. And if you make any money off this deal, the, you start off in any court dispute with a rebuttable presumption that you have taken unfair advantage or have used undue influence to get your client involved in something that you're involved in. And, and you work backwards from that point. In fact, there's one California case that says it doesn't even have to be, un, you don't even have to make an unusual profit, just that you make any profit. In California, where we are permitted to do business with our clients, there are very strict rules on the paperwork that has to be executed before we do the business, including an express requirement that we advise the client to seek independent counsel. So that would be the summary uh, from my viewpoint. These rules vary state by state, so you actually have to look up your own state's rules of professional conduct. There are some states where you can't do business with your client, period, and there are others where the, the, they're looser, but there's you know 50 sets of rules out there. Um, Tracy, let me turn to you and ask you to talk a little bit about um, how uh, an investment advisory firm like yours deals with the uh, situation of you're, you have a, a, a client, but the client comes to you through a lawyer or through some other business advisor. What are the rules that are imposed uh, from the organizations that regulate investment advisors or the securities industry in terms of um, what the duties are? Uh, sure. It, it would help me. How many people here are registered or registered investment advisors? Raise your hands. Okay. Nobody. Okay. Um, so let me just quickly go through. Um, what's important is that investment advisors are governed by both federal and securities laws, and, and there's quite a few of them. The Securities Act of 1933, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, Sarbanes-Oxley Oxley Act of 2002, Investment Company Act of 1940. I'd like you to listen to the dates, by the way, because if you notice, they coincide with some significant things that have happened in the world. <laughs> Everyone coincides with where we've had significant financial distress, right? Um, Title V of the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the Bank Secrecy Act, the OCC, ERISA 1974, and a lot of your clients may also be part of what we would call family office groups, where they act as individuals, we use that term, they need the best of the institutional world and the best of the private client world because they have businesses and then they have personal aspects to what they do. Most entertainment and sports clients have both those sides. And therefore, they may actually um, decide that they want to be chartered as a bank. That's becoming a very common thing. So then you're regulated by state laws, federal regulations, regulatory agencies, including the SEC, the Department of Labor, and the NASD. On some states, and in California this is particularly important because we see a lot of people not complying with this, you need to register as a fiduciary in many cases. And um, the other thing that I would tell you is that the trade associations put standards on you as well, or on us as well. 
the NFL, the NBA, the Financial Planning Association, the Association for Investment Management Research, AMER, you'll hear that, the CFP board, and the AICPA. So there's a lot of people overlooking what's done. And one of the things that I think is important is, are you vetting the people that you're doing business with? How do you know how they're complying with these rules and regulations? And um, in a minute, um, I know there's a, some additional questions. We'll talk about what are some of the things you need to be concerned about as it relates to these specific items. Well, let's talk about that now. Uh, there are rules um, on suitability of mm -hmm. investments. So if, in a, in a practical sense, um, if, if you have a client who, where there's a, where there's a lawyer or a manager that's interfacing, how do you, how do you um, set up uh, the uh, safeguards, practical safeguards for the client and for your firm uh, when you're dealing with lawyers in terms of the know your client rule and the suitability rules? Um, excellent question and very timely. Um, we're in unprecedented times right now. I don't have to tell you that. Everybody is looking at the TV every minute to see what's going on with the market. Uh, BNY Mellon, for example, is seen as one of the safe places. You might have seen that the government just awarded us um, the contract to help them with their $700 billion. We have tons of assets flowing in right now. One of the real issues we have is know your customer. And this relates to what you guys do as well. And Warren, who's my colleague over there, we just had a case come up last week of a, a famous person in the entertainment business. And the first thing we do when we're going to get into business, and we do it in conjunction with you, is we do really a background check. We want to know the history of the client. We want to know their background. We want to know their source of wealth. That's a huge thing. Well, in doing some research on this particular individual, there were mob connections, and they were actually part of the Mitchell Report. And I'm sure you guys know, if you're in the sports world, you know what the Mitchell Report is. You know, not a comment on this particular individual, but you, um, as advisors, need to determine, from a character standpoint, if that's somebody that you want to be doing business with. BNY Mellon is extremely conservative. There's a reason why we're seen as one of the safe places. It used to be kind of boring to be safe and conservative. Now it seems to be in vogue. Um, it'll probably go out of vogue at some point in the future when we all forget what's happening right now. Um, that's the first thing. Know your customer um, and source of wealth. You've got to go all the way back. Where did this money come from? In particular, if you're dealing with international clients, um, I know we were talking a little bit about Russia. You know, you have to know how people got their money out of their country. And if you don't have the resources, rely on your financial providers because they do. That's the first thing. The second Tracy, thing. Tracy, can I ask you? Yeah. When, in terms of knowing your customer, do you require meeting the customer or you want to do it through their representative? Uh, we prefer to meet the customer. We will do it through the representative if we have to, if it's not practical. But we'll go to additional levels of due diligence. And within the organizations that you're dealing with, hopefully, when you're referring, there's different levels of background checks. And, you, and, and the, we're regulated in terms of if people have suspicious activities, it gets a higher level of due diligence. And um, you can rely on that to help you do some due diligence if you don't have that access. And that's a great question. Um, in terms of the suitability, um, which was the second part of your question, incredibly important. Um, when we think about suitability, we think about it from a couple perspectives. The first perspective is, <clears throat> do we understand the risk tolerance of this client? What's going on right now with people? How many people here thought they should just sell everything and go to cash? Anybody? We call that timing the market. <laughs> okay, 92% of your return is determined by having the right investment plan. Okay, 92%, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Only 5% is determined by actually um, timing the market. Typically, historically, that's what things would tell you. Um, you need the right plan and it should be in writing. How many of your clients have written investment policy statements? That's the first place to start. Very good. Very impressive, because oftentimes we don't see that. That's one key thing that you want to make sure you have. From there, you can determine what managers you want to select or what investments. Um, and what's incredibly important, how many people here work with advisors that recommend open architecture, best-in-class management? Raise your hands. Now, what happens is if you hire a maybe, whole bunch Maybe you should explain what those are. When you hire a whole bunch of managers, <clears throat> Your asset allocation might say, let's have large company, large cap, 
Let's have a segment for mid companies, middle cap, and a segment for small cap. And somebody might say to you, well, we're going to hire one or two managers for each of these sections. Where it gets into trouble in a market like this is if you don't actually aggregate all those managers together and look at everything at the security level, the actual company holdings, I just did this for a client. They had 17% of their portfolio in a company called AIG. Okay probably not a company you want to be holding. And the reason is, is there wasn't one manager that held 17% of that company. One manager held 5%, one manager held 10%. One manager was selling it, the other was buying it. So it's incredibly important when you guys are looking at the suitability of investments that you understand how things are constructed or you're working with people that do and that you do audits on things, a statement analysis or an audit to pull it all together and look at it all the way down to the security level. And that you understand how all the pieces fit together and make sure there's not additional risk. Oftentimes there's a lot of additional risk when you put it together. The second thing is transparency. How many people feel that there was transparency in the current financial system that's going on? I see some smiles. You know, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. I hate to say it, it's just kind of the bottom line. And these guys are going to talk to you about how people get sued. <laughs> Remember, we're conservative, but if you don't understand what's going on or somebody isn't willing to show you, I can tell you in New York that there was a particular firm that was selling some private placement products and it went around the cocktail circuit. And really wealthy clients were saying to us, You've got to invest in this. If you don't, I'm pulling my assets. And you've got, it takes a strong person to say, you know what, we don't understand that and we're not comfortable with it. You can go and do that in a separate account or if it gets to the point where you feel really strongly about it, we just do not and are not comfortable. You need to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And oftentimes in private placement and private equity and hedge fund products, you can't see what's there. And that's where your biggest risks are. So transparency and understanding how everything rolls up and making sure what's being put into your clients' portfolios is appropriate and suitable for them, for their risk tolerance and for how it all fits together. You know, right now, what's going to happen? Everybody goes to cash. The OCC, who audits you, is going to say, well, if you have a lot of uninvested cash too long, that's a problem. When the market goes up and your client happens to be in cash, like what if your client sold last Friday? and then the market went up 700 basis points on Monday. I'm thinking there could be a lawsuit. Definitely. <laughs> so, so Michael. Uh, uh, can I just jump in on one thing Tracy said, and that's the investment policy statement. Investment policy statements are a great idea both for you and for someone like Tracy at Bank of New York. However, if you don't update those investment policy statements, they actually come back to haunt you. Because oftentimes over time, uh, circumstances change, your clients have different financial uh, abilities to invest in different things, or maybe they have uh, gotten older and their risk profile has changed. And if the investment policy statement stays the same and the, the portfolio looks the same, but the client's circumstances have changed, you're going to get hung on that. So it's important not to just do it in the beginning, but to, to maintain that process all along, both for you and for right. someone like Tracy. So, so Michael, um, <clears throat> great to have you here this morning and you you. give a perspective of this kind of practice that you know really clearly mixes and matches a law firm and a uh, uh, agency relationship because a lot of lawyers who attend this conference are part of a team for either artists or for athletes that consists of business managers and uh, managers agents and then uh, and, and others um, so in, in, in terms of operating Eclipse and your law practice and dealing with your um, athlete clients, um, how do you structure things so that uh, you avoid pitfalls? Well, first of all, the two companies are completely separate, but I've always treated my activities as an agent as if I were the lawyer for the client rather than the agent. And I take my ethical responsibilities seriously with that company the same way I do with the law firm. But it is a much more difficult proposition to manage these things when you're dealing from the perspective of an agent because you actually are a business manager for the client. The client has generally no experience with anything beyond their specific sport because they've been training for it from a very young age. They probably dropped out of school and they got money at a very young age when they probably didn't have an idea of 
how to be responsible about maintaining that. They're approached by people at all times with crazy investment ideas that all sound terrific. Their friends on the team get involved in them. They feel pressure to do the same thing. They're sending them to you all the time. Another problem uh, that I'm faced with, aside from my players, is that I'm having people from investment firms, sometimes well-known names, sometimes schlocko firms, coming to me trying to get access to my players. I have a very good answer for those people. Um, when I hear someone say, I'm from Smith Barney, or I say, say I'm from Merrill Lynch, I immediately say, well, I can't talk to you because I sue your company all the time. And I get out of it that way. But I'm constantly getting uh, inquiries, trying to get access to the players. The thing that you have to be careful about is these opportunities that are coming in for the players generally are people trying to take advantage of them because they're high profile people. And so the best thing to do is to have everything sent to my office and my general practice is to uh, look through them but not bring them up with the player unless the player brings them up with me, which is very rare. The player is not going to bring them up with me. If the player wants to press about it, I realize that my specialty is not finance. I have the ability to oversee the financial activities that are taking place on behalf of the client, but it's not my specialty. So what I do is I bring the player together with the financial advisor that the player has selected, and we go over these opportunities together. In the end, I make it clear that I'm not a financial advisor, and if the player wants to go ahead with this, it's going to be something that he's doing based on his own uh, review of, of the investment uh, activity, plus together with the advice of the manager, of the financial advisor. But I always write to the client explaining that I don't think it's wise for them to deviate from their financial plan that we've made together through this investment policy. And I also make it clear that I don't think that they need to be taking undue risks because I know a lot of you deal with artists and entertainers. It's a bit different than dealing with an athlete in that an athlete has a very short lifespan in which they're going to earn money. And if they take undue risk during that time period when they're earning these tremendous amounts, they're never going to be able to recover those funds that they lost, whereas entertainers have continued opportunities to try and develop their asset base. So my general policy with the players is to try and keep them involved in a very conservative plan. But there are a lot of pressures coming from all sides, and it's difficult to uh, juggle it all. So let me ask you this. Suppose um, you, the client brings you a deal and you talk to the, prom the promoter of the deal, um, the organizers of the deal, and they say to you, um, you know, if your client does this deal, uh, you know, we're going to pay you a referral fee of X dollars. How do you deal with that? That must come up all the time. It certainly does. Uh, number one, I would never, ever make an investment with my client. It's just a, a hard and fast rule with my company. Number two, I would never accept any funds in connection with something that my client does. The only way I earn fees is directly from my client based on the contract that they sign with their professional team. And I'm not going to deviate from that because that is certainly the way to get into a situation where you need to retain Jerry. <laughs> I need about 10% of you doing this at any given time. <laughs> well, Jerry, um, I mean, can, can you use conflict waivers, written conflict waivers, to avoid problems in the circumstance where someone's being offered a referral fee of, uh, for, for referring an investment or putting a client in there? You know, the, the, the conflict waivers, if they're properly written, do better for you to keep the state bar off your back and don't do a whole hell of a lot out there and getting sued. Because sooner or later, I mean, strip away all the rules, strip away all the technical mumbo jumbo. You're sitting there in front of a jury explaining to them that your judgment was not skewed because somebody paid you a $100,000 referral fee. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we, we, we got that. The problem I see with most conflict waivers is they're really not specific enough to warn the consumer, the client, what the conflict is. I have seen them as thin as, I'm gonna represent two of you in this matter, and you understand two people have potential conflicts and you waive them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay. But if you really were to lay it out specifically, for instance, if someone was gonna take a referral fee from a promoter, you say, promoter has paid me $100,000 
uh, as a reward for getting you to invest one million dollars of your money in his company. I mean, that's plain English. And not too many of us are going to even do that, let alone have our clients accept that. And it all, you know, it all rolls back. I, I use different examples. Uh, you know, we're fiduciaries. Well, well what does that mean? <clears throat> that means I get paid to do my best job and give my best judgment to you or to you or to you. And that's it. And if I'm getting paid by other people, if I'm out hustling business from other people who are on the other side, at some level that has to interfere with my judgment. And when we get called, whether it's in front of the state bar or whether it's being civilly sued, the question's going to be, what did you do to exercise that independent <coughs> judgment on behalf of that client for which you were charging four or five or six or seven hundred bucks an hour to talk to them on the telephone? And what was available to you that a reasonable, reasonable fiduciary would have done? You hear transparency, and I oftentimes use the example, how long would you keep your money in the bank if the bank sent you a statement every two or three or four months, whatever it felt like it, and said, uh, you got 120 grand in our bank? You know, you think of the level of detail that comes in a bank statement and the level of detail that we want when we're making decisions. How much time do we spend in the law books? How many times do we send our associates back second, third, and fourth time? The eighth round of discovery. We want an awful lot of detail. So rolling back and, and completing the circle, conflict waivers properly written will give great caution to our clients. They will give great caution to us just writing them. I've, I've known people who by the time we write the conflict waiver, they decide they don't want to get involved. That's the lawyer. <laughs> no, 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 no. i got to put that down. I don't want to do it. Uh, they do tend to be somewhat protective of the ethics prosecution. Well, I warned the client, okay, let him just sue you. Um, I, I've sat there, I, I testify as an expert a lot. I, I, do, I haven't tried a jury trial in decades. But I just sit there and look at those juries. I listen to the arguments of the attorneys and it's like, you know, you didn't exercise judgment. You got bought off. That's what happened. So going back to something you mentioned earlier, Jerry, the, uh, the issue of doing business with the client. In California, anyway, that's permitted. You have to jump through some hoops. How do you, how do you effectively um, <coughs> protect yourself against liability in those situations? And how does that relate to the contingency fee? A lot of entertainment lawyers will take on uh, clients and they will work on a contingency basis. In other words, they get a percentage of the uh, revenues from entertainment endeavors. Um, so how do, how do those rules dovetail? And well, in California, any kind of contingency contract representation requires a written contract. And if it doesn't meet the technicality of California rule, the if the client's option at any time, it can be voided. And now you get quantum merit, reasonable value of services. Contingency fees, almost by definition, are unreasonably high. And they're unreasonably high, generally speaking, because there's risk factor involved. So we get rewarded for risk. Therefore, reasonable quantum merit drops, drops the fee down. There's, there's one economic incentive. The other thing about doing business with the client is you have to lay it out in writing to the client. What is this business venture we are doing together? What are the pros and cons of it? Uh, here it is in plain English to you. Uh, you would be surprised in litigation how many of your smartest clients go dumb. Uh, well, I didn't know what a deed of trust was, or I didn't realize there was risk, or the, the worst, and, and I see this a lot in my expert work, they come to you for legal advice and suddenly you're responsible for the business trans underlying business transaction having gone bad. Gee, if you had advised me that this, this business had that risk and this business had this risk, I wouldn't have gone into it. When you're doing business with your own client, you've got to get into that risk. Then you've got to give it to the client in writing and language the client understands. Uh, I deal with attorneys. I can assume that most of you can read and write plain English at a you know, high school graduation level. You know, Mike described some of his clients are, are you know, school dropouts. Maybe they read at the eighth grade level. Well, they read Czech and Russian very well. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Had a landlord like that understood Czech. <laughs> and no other, right, no, nothing else. Um, and then the client has to have time to consider it, and in California, we have to advise the client 
I advise you to go seek another attorney to look over this whole thing. That other attorney, looking over the transaction, even signing off on it, does not prevent liability on our part because we still have the initial duty to the client. <coughs> so probably the reason we can do business with clients in California is a bit of the, you know, the old west is still out here. Uh, there are some states, Richard and I worked on a case once where we were comparing the rules of the two states. And uh, in one state, the business, California, the business transaction was okay with certain bells and whistles. In the other state uh, that, that the attorney and client were also connected to, the, the attorney was prohibited outright from doing business with the client. Um, you know, if none of you did business with your clients and you all wrote really good conflict waivers, I'd, I'd need to get a second specialty. Uh, yeah. But that's, that's it. If you're going to march into that risky area, then write it up in plain English, get it signed, make sure the client has plenty of time to think about it. So the flip side of the liability for the transaction, if it goes bad, is, is the lawyer who engages in business with their client um, losing their participation because when, when the transaction goes good and a lot of money is made because they don't follow the rules, um, and there are, are you know, some pretty stiff positions that were taken in cases like that. So how far do you have to go? I mean, it says, tell the client they can go see another lawyer. Does that mean, um, you know, give them a time to do that, to direct them to do that? What's the language that you would use when you're trying to fulfill that requirement? I mean, I've seen words like, I urge you to seek client. Uh, right. I won't do this unless you go to right. another lawyer. Right. You have to get the other lawyer to sign off on it. If the, if the client comes back to you and says, I don't want to see another lawyer. I've got you. You're my lawyer. What, what, do, you, what do you tell them? Legal and the practical. The legal in California is, I recommend that you seek the advice of an independent lawyer other than me. Give you the papers and throw you out of my office. The practical is, Number one, if the client signs the paper right there on the spot, they have not had sufficient time to consult counsel. And so what I like to tell my client lawyers is, take that package and mail it to your client and add a line that says, please take as much time as you need for this. And so the client has to make the affirmative step of signing it and bringing it back to you. And there's little or no argument about the client having sufficient time because the client has made the decision. If you're involved in a transaction where the other side is saying, oh, this is a good deal and you got to do it right now, well, you know, what did, what did Tracy say? If it sounds too good to be true? Same thing with high pressure. I mean, it just, just isn't worth it. Uh, a lot of times now, this being what, my, my 16th year doing defense work on, in the private sector, a lot of times now I realize the question I have to ask my own client is, how badly do you need this work? this project, this client, this transaction. Uh, if you're acting out of desperation, you're probably overlooking something. And if you stop and think about it, if you're a reasonably successful attorney in this business, whatever this transaction is, whatever the fee it brings in, someone will be in next week, next month, next year, and pick up that slack. You know, on, on the first day of free agency, if it sounds too good to be true, it, it might be true. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, these, these, these things go through. What's, what's the level of risk? Contingency lawyers are bigger risk takers than estate planners. That's just the nature of the beast. I, I have to tell, I, I, do, again, I do a lot of work for contingency injury lawyers. And one of the first things I have to tell them is, I'm an hourly rate lawyer. I am not a contingency fee lawyer. Okay, there's a reason I do that. I have a less tolerance for risk and you guys going out there. Um, the, the investors, you heard this, the whole speech from Tracy about being conservative. Uh, so, so you have to look internally to yourself, and there's only so much you can accomplish about what you can do. If you want to take risk, double your malpractice coverage, and, and budget for hiring somebody like me once every few years. <laughs> well, one thing Tracy said that shouldn't be missed is that 92 percent of your return is going to be based on asset allocation and I think the biggest trouble you'll get in is if you allow your clients to over concentrate in a particular investment or a particular investment 
style or group or asset uh, because if you spread the risk through different assets, you're much more likely, much less likely to get in trouble with your clients. So shifting gears a little bit, Michael, uh, in your, in your uh, law, law practice where you're representing people who have lost money with investment advisors or other advisors, um, what issues come up with lawyers? I mean, for example, you have a case that involves uh, a particular type of investment and there was a, there was a tax opinion. Um, what are you looking for in terms of whether or not you can uh, establish liability of a lawyer for some role in the investment structure? Well, all these disputes are held in securities arbitration under the auspices of FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory <coughs> Authority. It's a combination of NASD and NYSE regulation. And in these arbitrations, I'd say 95% of the time it's going to come down to documents. Parties always have differing opinions about what actually happened, and the panel wants to look to the documents. So they're going to look to the documents that came from Bank of New York, for instance, from the client, but they're also going to look to the outside advisors, whether there was an investment policy statement that was provided by an outside advisor, whether when certain transactions were going to trigger massive capital gains taxes, there was an opinion sought from a tax advisor, whether it be a, an accountant or a lawyer. And those documents are critical to the entire process. So if you're a lawyer that's managing this type of arrangement between your clients and uh, uh, an institution, you need to make sure that the documents reflect the advice that you're giving to your client. Because if those documents are not there, that's just as telling as documents that are there. And as Tracy mentioned, the investment policy statement needing to be updated, so do these other documents. If you just leave it to the one time that you did it, and this is a six, seven, eight, nine year relationship, there's going to be trouble down the road if the market turns like it has now and sunlight is, is, is now on these over concentrations or unsuitable investments. Right, and if, if I might add, um, the regulators do impose requirements on the investment managers that you work with to check in on things. <coughs> what you really need to do is make sure that they're checking in and it's documentable and they, they, the larger firms get audited the smaller firms might get audited. Um, so, for example, they're looking to see if there's concentrations, and if there are, to Michael's point, there needs to be documentation in the file that a conversation was had and a plan is in place for how to deal with it. Might be okay to have the concentration, but there needs to be something in writing that says we visited this and we had a reasonable thought process around it. Um, there needs to be documentation around fees. Fees is oftentimes an area that conflicts of issues come up, and I'm, I'm sure Jerry will be happy to talk about how people get themselves in trouble around fees. Um, there also needs to be um, it around investment objectives, which Michael talked about. If somebody's plan changes, have, has the plan that's in writing changed? So basically, there's about 10 key areas that they get audited on. And you can simply ask, you know, what are you doing for checks and balances? And how do I know that this is being done? And then you can also ask in your annual review, for an audit of these particular areas so that you, you can see and check to make sure the checks and balances are being done. Again, if you're with a larger firm, they have the procedures in place. The smaller firms, you're reliant on them to put the procedures in place, and many of them are good and do, but you need to make sure it's there. So, Michael, what about um, clients who come to you and, and, and want you to perform due diligence? I, you know, you talked about this separation between your two practices, but what are, what are the duties that a lawyer has generally on clients who say, I want you to tell me whether this is a good deal or a bad deal, and, and, and what kind of writing are you going to develop to protect yourself? Well, the first thing I think it's incumbent upon anybody to determine if they have the ability to evaluate this. Just because your client comes to you and says that they want you to evaluate doesn't mean that you have that ability. I've had clients come to me and say that they want to invest in certain things offered by the Czech government related to solar power. And I don't really have the ability to, to evaluate that because I can't read Czech and there's nobody who's going to, to give me an opinion about solar power in the EU and, and Czech. So I, I tell them that we're going to have to find somebody in the Czech Republic who can evaluate this and then we're going to have to either rely on their opinion or, or shy away from it. So the first step is evaluating whether you have the capability to do this. The second thing is if you do know something about it, like let's say it's just opening a brokerage account and who's going to be the right advisor for this brokerage account, 
you need to make sure that the client has access to more than one person if you want to protect yourself. The client needs to meet three to four people to, and make an independent evaluation whether they're happy with this person. If they're happy with that person, then it's my job to continue to oversee them. And what I do is I call them regularly. I speak to the advisors at least once a month. I document that in my own records. I have email communications going back and forth about the things that we talked about. I make sure that the client knows that we talked. And I make sure that the client comes in to meet the financial advisor or the financial advisor goes to meet the client twice a year, every year. And each time that happens, there needs to be a summary of the continued investment philosophy of the client. And that's how I try and protect myself and the client. I just want to add, add something, an old cliche. Just because I know how to drive a car doesn't mean I know how the engine works. I can look at it, in theory, as an attorney, I can look at an investment contract and advise my clients on the terms they're getting involved in, the legalities and what the code says and what they're waiving. Just because I'm an attorney and just because I can do that does not mean I have a clue as to whether this is a good investment or a bad investment for this client at this time. And where I see attorneys getting into trouble is after they've done this for a while, believing that they understand the investment, what I'll call the business side of the transaction. And I've seen attorneys get in trouble anywhere from just being sloppy about it making bad investment decisions or making investment decisions that go bad and now they're accountable for them, uh, to being hoodwinked. One guy thought he was being pretty good. He's looking, I think it had to do with solar power and did not realize that he was one of several victims of a very elaborate scam in which people actually came out to the solar farm and looked at stuff that was just crap. But they were showing it to people who didn't have the scientific <coughs> knowledge to understand. They were just looking at something that had nothing to do with solar power. Uh, so understand our limits, I, I, I think, and that, that applies across the board from, you know, don't do that case for a friend of yours that's outside your specialty because you just kind of want to help, to if you're advising somebody on the legal side of their business deals but not on the business side, make it clear and make it clear in writing that you're not making any business judgments for them, that somebody else has to do that and that you're, you're, you're advising them on the soundness of... The one, the, the one that I'm thinking of right now, I saw a case in which the lawyer vetted the contract between a restaurant owner and a building owner, and it was for a restaurant, and when the, when the restaurant tanked, the restaurant owner came back and said, well, Mr. Smith should have advised me that this was a bad deal. <coughs> you know, Mr. Smith doesn't know restaurants. But there was just enough lack of clarity in the facts and enough lack of writing uh, to keep me employed for a while. So that's it. Question back there. Yeah. Lon Sobel, I'm, I'm the chair of this hearing. What you just said actually harkened back to uh, circumstances that I had and that I'll bet other people in the room had that I had back when I was in practice. And that is that the nature of my relationship with the client was quite clearly attorney-client. In my case, the client wasn't the ball player or an actor, but actually a very successful businessman. He gave me private placement memoranda and offering circulars because they were thick and difficult to comprehend. And all he wanted and all I understood I was giving him was a plain English explanation of the circumstances under which he might receive a share of profits if there were profits and an evaluation of the accuracy of the tax consequences portion of the offering circular. So I was giving him pure legal advice. It didn't occur to me then, and didn't occur to me until you just said it, Jerry, that I also then should have had some sort of a letter to him in which I, who was 30 years his junior, he, who was a successful businessman, I should have then told him in writing that I was only giving him legal advice and that the wisdom, the financial value of the investment was for him to make. We should do that? Yes, it's, it's laying out the scope of representation to the client, and wh why would you do it? Many of us have long-term clients, we have very comfortable relationships with them, we don't worry about it, and where I, where I worry about it, or to, you know, to quote from the movie, I get paid to worry when there's nothing to worry about, uh, is when the company that buys out your client is in litigation with your widow over the scope of your representation. And 
it, it helps clarify relationships that may not be as good as that one uh, to lay it out. This is what I do, but this is what I don't do. And my concern is day-to-day -day transactions that go bad. If that transaction went bad and a multi-millionaire loses $10,000, he might not think about it. If he lost $200 million, well, he just might sue you. Uh, Jerry, in, in my yeah. legal practice, it's, it's very, very easy to separate and make those lines. I can tell clients that this is the settlement and, and these are the rights you're giving up in the settlement. But in terms of the monies you're receiving, I have no idea about the tax consequences and you're going to have to consult with an accountant or a tax lawyer. And I leave it at that. It's very clear. It says in my retainer agreement I don't provide tax <coughs> advice. With the agency, the players expect that you do everything. And that applies to things I'd rather not even talk about, like <laughs> arranging <laughs> trips and whatever. But they expect that you do everything. So the nature of the relationship is very different. And you have to provide services that you would never provide in a, in a law firm environment. And, 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 and that's OK. My point is not that you should or shouldn't do it. My point is you should do it with your eyes wide open so you know what you're doing. And you should define what the scope of the representation is. Because I want to take you down to the very, very last two groups of people. My, my partner and I published an article on this recently. One of them are what we call toxic clients. And these are people who, because who they are and who I am and what the nature of the relationship is, it will eventually go bad, uh, no matter how good or how bad I am. It's just, it's, I know, you know, first date. <laughs> you know right then. Uh, and the other is what we're seeing an increasing number of, given the complexity and the size of the society we live in, is the predatory client. You defined a relationship that was similar to one of the first clients I ever got. And I realized it was a guy who was not such a savory business person who deliberately looked for new attorneys to handle his legal work because he could get it cheap and he could sooner or later take advantage of us because he knew a whole lot more about the process uh, than we did. And that can happen at a much older age. You know, when I, when I was in my first year and somebody pulled a fast one on me, I felt like, well, this is experience. So if someone pulls a fast one on me this month, I'm embarrassed. But it still happens. It happens to all of us. So one, one area, then we'll take some questions. Um, what, are the, what, what, are the, what are the issues from the state bar compliance point of view? I mean, that's a big part of your practice. So if you get involved in a situation with a client, the client ends up making a complaint to the state bar because you did business with them, you didn't follow the rules, what are the, what are the problems that come up? Problems are very simple. The state bar, like most regulators, are rule-oriented. They read the rule, they look at what you did, you complied or you didn't comply. The reason why maybe you didn't comply are very interesting, but in a rule-oriented society, it's kind of like the speed limit. You know, you get very little wiggle room on the speed limit. It's, if they ticket me for doing 26 miles an hour driving by a school, I can't beat it because it says 25. Uh, so that's what they look for, first of all, is what the rule is. And, and then they look at the consequences of the behavior. <clears throat> so it's very difficult, say, if you didn't have a conflict of interest waiver, which, by the way, has to be signed by both clients, not just one. All right, so if you don't have the conflict waiver and the lawsuit or the transaction goes bad, then from a regulatory viewpoint, people who work for the government and have never had clients out there, they say, well, gee whiz, you're responsible for the entire transaction going bad because you didn't get a conflict waiver because poor, you know, poor widow here never would have gotten into that but for the absence of the conflict waiver. And so you're already 20 steps behind trying to explain, well, you know, this is an athlete and he came in in a hurry and, you know, we did this, we did that. Uh, business guy who's, you know, 20 years more experienced than I am and could see what this transaction was about. So we don't actually have that many rules that govern us as attorneys uh, in, in the great scheme of things. And what they mostly amount to, besides being decent and honest, is certain kinds of transactions must be documented in writing and they must be well explained. And so that's what you do. And just like you know, my dentist wants an informed consent for me before I'll stick a piece of machinery in my mouth, uh, I want a fee agreement and, if necessary, a conflict waiver or joint client consent or some other kind of 
authorization paper that spells out the nature of my relationship with the client. Then I want to update it. And so that, that's basically it. Other than that, you, you could, in the worst case, be looking at discipline and, you know, be out of work for a few months or a couple of years. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, Warren. Hi, uh, Warren Cohn, just by way of disclosure, I'm a colleague of Tracy Nichols and I head up our sports and entertainment practice at BNY Mellon. Uh, the question for the panel is, um, the majority of all of our clients, both in the entertainment talent side as well as the sports and, and, and athlete clients, come with a team of oftentimes both an entertainment attorney as well as a business manager. To a credit to most people in this room, I rarely see where their attorney has uh, gone into business with them, which is a topic of a lot of discussion here, and advise them on investment management issues. However, on the business management side, there is a sizable minority of business managers um, who do both invest with their clients, go into business with their clients, and or direct their investment issues. My question for the panel is, is, is there a conflict of interest? How is, is it a lack of enforceability in the CPA society that doesn't obviously cross over into the, to the legal world? Um, that allows business managers to do that, and how much of a litigious issue do you find that entertainment attorneys ought to be thinking about and people in this room for their clients who also invest with their business managers? Well, obviously it's a different set of rules, but from the standpoint of litigation, just in court, you know, the, the conflict of interest is the basis of a professional negligence claim. Um, it's just a different set of rules. I mean, and, you know, and if the CPA is getting compensated by the promoter or the investment is uh, as much evidence of conflict of interest as in any other situation. Anybody want to add to that? Well, I'm a, a licensed agent with the National Hockey League Players Association. They don't have any restrictions on what we can do. The restrictions that I have are self-imposed. Um, so I couldn't answer it from the perspective of what I'm limited by except what Richard just said. It's any situation you're prone to an evidence claim. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on deferred compensation and fee agreements with your clients investment offers? The clients eventually you see retainer agreements will say XP plus two points deferred compensation. The film area, just assuming that the film makes money down the road as opposed to money. Is that is that business with your client? Do you run into that? Is that a problem area? Uh, I haven't seen this factual scenario before, so not much I could answer. But I, I think if I just step back from it, you, you've raised the question I have seen from time to time, which is when the nature of the relationship with the client is such that it's not so much a fee, but you have transferred it to a business relationship. Be, I, I've seen them in more extremes. The one you've described, I haven't, so I don't... It's like I can guess off the top of my head, but that's about it. I don't think that's any different than a situation that was very common in California seven or eight years ago when, you know, before the dot-com bust, law firms were taking stock in startup companies, which clearly is doing business with the client. I mean, I don't see any difference between that and what you're talking about, which is taking some points at the back end of a deal, um, which uh, is part of the is part of your compensation. And taking what the back end deal, have you seen situations where that has caused problems? I mean, I've seen agreements like that. So must represent folks who are. Well, you know, I used to, th I used to think that uh, the the line in in, uh, in my contingency litigation agreement that said I have a a lien for the recovery was you know, perfectly fair and reasonable. And, and then a case came down saying you have to get a lawyer to approve of that um, in California. So I, I think you have to take the most conservative approach and say, you know, am I, am I violating the rule that says you can't do business with the client without jumping through hoops? And as Jerry said, there are some states, I know you're from, uh, from Virginia, right? There are some states that don't allow it at all, and there's other states like California where you can do it. You just have to jump through certain hoops in order to do it. Got a question over there. Hi, my name is Dr. I practice in Nigeria where the news are not so, the news world is not so robust. Um, but I have comments as well as a question. Um, now, for the client, um, attorney client relationship, um, in Nigeria, it's almost like what Michael said apart from giving legal advice, you 
act like an agent a lot of the time and you have to do all kinds of things for the client. So you have to have your own self-imposed rules to say, no, I can't go that way. And what we do is, um, a lot of the time when we get to parts or specialties that are not ours, we do refer our We can refer, we don't, we don't necessarily refer them, but we seek the advice of those experts, get the opinion and get to the clients. Because sometimes when you send clients, you're like sending them away, so you have to be careful and you have to you have to have a balance to this. <coughs> my question, when I see across board that everybody's just trying everybody's trying to play safe basically. Um, while we do not have such really stringent rules and the clients suing, you know, while that is growing, uh, I'd like to ask that how do you really create a balance? You have a client who you built a relationship with for twelve years, you know, and he comes with you to you with uh, something. Um, some investment he wants you to advise him or her on, you know, how do you create a balance with not sending them away, trying to keep safe, not sending them away, you know, I, I, I for, for us as a firm, we, as much as possible, we try to go with the clients on, on their business plan. What I mean is not necessarily, not necessarily that you, you're just going to go with them, uh, whether it's wrong or right, or wh whether it's on source that's, that's illegal or not. But as much as possible, we go with them and see how far we can help them with, you know. So how do you create a balance? My second question is, what about where you as a lawyer or a law firm wants to invest in a client? Like we had a client who was very talented and uh, but she had she had issues with a manager that she had for about three years who was kind of just milking her and at the end of the day she took the, as, as the, when the contract ended, she ended the relationship and she was out there, she wanted to get an album out, but she didn't have funds. What's your take on investing in a client? Well, with, with your first question, generally, my rule of thumb is that if I have a good relationship with my client, then I'm willing to send them to other people to seek professional advice, and I'm secure in the fact that I think I'm going to keep that client. If I don't have that type of relationship, and it's vulnerable to somebody else speaking to them, then I had a lot to worry about in the first place, and it, it wasn't the type of relationship that was probably going to last for a very long time. So I've never been hesitant about sending them to people who can provide better advice than I can, and I certainly use tax advisors and financial advisors and insurance advisors for my clients all the time, and these people meet with my client. And I've never had someone stolen through that methodology. But uh, people are trying to steal players all the time in, in, in my business, unlike my law firm clients where that, that never really happens. So I'm not too concerned uh, about sending my players out to, to other people. Um, I don't know. Uh, um, kind of two inconsistent comments from me. When I was brand new and every client counted and every lost client was desperation, I was really concerned about that. And I started establishing not only good client relations, but relationships with other people, other lawyers, people in other professions. It's, it, you begin to learn who's reliable and who's not. And so... You, you might call in somebody to advise the client, but you're doing the supervising, or you might send the client out, but you begin learning who the other reliable business people in your community are so they don't steal your client out from under you. Now that I'm more established, I'll tell you the same thing Mike did, which is somebody comes in and they want, there's something I can't do, I have no hesitation giving them somebody else's name because I'm comfortable they'll come back. And if they don't, they're probably not as good a client as I'd like them to be anyhow. Uh, the, your second question is a variation of what I spoke about a couple times here, where under California law, if you are going to, as you put it, invest in your client, do business with your client, there's a whole lot of explanation we California lawyers are required to give our clients in writing, and we're specifically required under California law to advise those clients to seek the advice of an independent attorney before coming back and letting us do it. It is the sort of transaction that is in, it works in two ways. If, if, if your client goes out and makes a lot of money, at some point they're going to think they're paying you too much because they'll forget how poor they were today. 
Yeah. And, and if the transaction goes bad in California, they'll sue you and say it was your fault. So it's a high risk transaction, that's all. Uh, and you make your, part, part of your decision is the legal technicality. Much more of it is we forget sometimes we're in business. I'm a, I'm, I'm a small business, right? And so I'm making business judgments all the time. And one of my business judgments, if I take your example, is how much risk am I willing to undertake to get involved in helping to finance this person and hoping that I make a good profit off it in the future if they become successful? Um, it's a business decision and it has business risk. Essentially, I invest in, in nearly every one of my clients because in order to uh, get a client in, in the hockey world, you have to get them when they're about 15 or 16 years old. And there's really a low percentage that they're, number one, going to get drafted into the NHL, number two, get a contract in the NHL, and number three, actually make it to the NHL. So your odds of actually getting paid on these clients is very low. But that's an investment. But we would never actually put dollars into the career or, or some business proposition of our clients. Okay, let's take one more question, then we have to wrap it up, and I'm sure the panelists will be here for other questions. Uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, first, um, would this apply, or would it be applied if, uh, if the investment that you're being asked to consider is completely unrelated to the client's talent? So, for example, you have a recording artist who wants to start a uh, parking garage to diversify and wants capital. And the B part of the question is, uh, to what degree, percentage-wise, do you think these rules are actually adhered to? <laughs> Second part was that, to what extent are the rules adhered to? Uh, I think the rules are adhered to most of the time, and I make a really good living on the rest. <laughs> I, I practice disaster law. You know, you can have a thousand transactions that work out just fine, and I'll see the last five. And it's, that's, I think, the nature of it. I think most of us are out there trying to do the job and trying to follow the rules. And, some group of people will deliberately ignore them and some will accidentally violate them and most transactions occur and I never hear about them. You know, there's 200,000 California lawyers that have only got 40 as clients right now. <laughs> as far as the first part of your question, it, it doesn't matter to me what the investment is. We won't make it. You know, you. we get asked this a lot, and I actually think it's an interesting question. And one of the things that I would say, if you, and we call it business decisions as well, ironically, I and mean, we do get involved in a lot of these aspects, especially for the entertainment clients and sports clients. Um, one of the things that I would think about as well, if they're going to do another transaction, oftentimes they need things like financing. And so one of the things you need to think about is, you, you said it before, are you introducing them to three investment managers? Are you getting three quotes on the loans, for example? What are you doing to make sure that you're being unbiased if you decide you're going to move through the transaction? That stuff's critically important. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks for your attendance. And thanks for your